<clears throat> this is Meet the Author, and I'm your host, Tigner Rand. Today, I have a pleasure talking with two gentlemen who have spent a decade interviewing and following the lives of street children in Lukasa, Zambia. Chris Lockhart and Daniel Chamba. Chris, who is an anthropologist by trade, has also worked across Africa as an independent researcher, consultant in the area of global health, human rights, and journalism. Daniel Chama is a former street child from Lukasa. He currently works as an outreach worker, which in the United States is better known as more like a social worker. In their new book, Walking the Bowl, a true story of murder and survival among the street children of Lukasa, Lusaka, is very picturesque. You see a lot of imagery, a lot of life about the young children in the country of Zambia. Daniel and Chris also was teamed up with eight dedicated researchers as they really immersed themselves into the street culture and followed around the children. During their research, they stumbled across a murder of a street child. That, that death soon became the focus of the book. Walking the Bowl is based on true incidents that occurred on the streets of Lusaka, yet the book reads like a novel. The book is vividly depicted with very harsh realities of what the children go through every day of life, horrible conditions from police corruption, sex work, rape culture, drug addiction, gang, gang life, extreme disparity when it comes to income. All of this unfolds through the book, Walking the Bowl. Without further ado, I'd like to bring the two gentlemen to the front. We can talk about their new book, Chris Lockhart and Daniel Chama. How are you guys doing today? We're doing thank great. Thanks thank for, you for having us. Yeah, thanks, Tigner. Before we get started, this is the copy of the book, yes. Walking the Bowl. This book is, will be available on blackbookstore.com. So it, this is a very good read. It's very touching, heartwarming. It's, it's, you get a lot of emotions from this book. Yes. You feel love. You get anger. And reality of what children really go through, we, a lot of us are just unaware of. So if you guys can kind of give a synopsis of what the book is all about to kind of bring everyone into the conversation with us before we get into the questions. I'll, um, I can start by just saying in general, I mean, you did a really good introduction there, Tigner. It's basically about, about these four street children and how their lives get caught up and interconnected in the murder of another street child. But as we tell that story, you know, we highlight, we try to highlight the wider systemic structures of violence that determine and shape the world of street children and, and, and try to show how complicated that world is. It's, 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 it's got a lot of different things going on every day. Um, not just abuse and violence, but hope and perseverance. And these kids are, are like kids anywhere. And they dream about, you know, becoming doctors and lawyers. And meanwhile, trying to survive on the streets. Um, so, the, so the book, when, when this murder happened, we really focused in on, on, on the murder of this kid. Um, so in some sense, the book is a true crime story. But at the wider level, it's about shining a light on the lives of these street kids themselves and, and, and the social injustices they face and how they persevere in, in the face of all of this. Yeah, most definitely, because it was a lot of perseverance. And, and yeah. you could hear from through your words how these young people wanted to do something bigger and better than what they were doing, but they were caught into the, the entrapment of their environment. Yes. Yeah. You touched on four four individuals pretty much throughout the book. Uh, make sure I'm pronouncing it right. Is that Lusabello? Lusabilo. 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 Yeah. Capula. Yes. Timo and Mango. Manga. Munga. 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 Yeah. It's interesting how each one of these young people's lives intertwine. They they. They cross paths directly and indirectly throughout the entire book. Did you all just happen to stumble across that by meeting these? Or did, what did uh, I guess, Daniel, did you know any of these individually prior to you start doing this research and writing the book? Yes, absolutely. Um, it's uh, 
uh, basically a thing of trust. When you when you when you work with these kids, you need to build trust because as a social worker, uh, it's 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 a thing that's in you. You are born with it. So uh, trust is is a, is a major uh, aspect when working and dealing with these kids. Wow. You, a brief story about yourself, Danny. You was a street child, so who who was the, your advocate to help you get off the street to help you to get to where you are now? What was the backstory to that? Yeah, um, it takes courage, and um, it's uh, it's an experience, and it's not a good thing. But coming from that background turned me around as an individual and put me where I am today. Awesome. Have you all been able to help other kids the same way since the, since the book to help others off the street? Yes, indeed, because um, what the title tells you, walking the ball, doing a good deed to the next person. And that's absolutely what I've done. Yes. I'm glad you brought that up. I love the story about walking the ball. So just give a little backstory of the title just so that people could understand because when I first saw it, Walking the Bowl, I'm like, okay, that's an odd title. But then <laughs> as you read it, it makes perfect sense why it's called Walking the Bowl. So yeah. without giving too much away, if you could just kind of give a kind of a backstory of why you guys decided to use that title. So uh, basically, Walking the Bowl is a parable. Um, I think in in it's a story that you hear in Zambia a lot. Sometimes it has that component of walking the bull and sometimes it doesn't. Uh, I've heard different versions, but uh, walking the bull is basically like in America, we would say paying it forward. If you can't pay somebody back, uh, pay it forward to the next person. So walking the bull is exactly that. Walk the bull to the next, next person. So uh, it's about random acts of kindness and good deeds and how powerful they are and how much they can make a difference. Even in this context of working with street kids who face such overwhelming odds, they walked the bowl or paid it forward with these random acts of kindness every day. And that's, that's a big part of their survival strategy. And the funny thing about this is that um, when we first wrote the, the first draft of the book, uh, we didn't have walking the bull in there even uh, as a, as part of the book. Uh, because really? we were so, Yeah. And I think that was my fault and my bias because I was focusing so much on, on the structures and injustices and, and the violence that these kids face every day. And I really wanted to bring that out. And then when we read that the first draft of the book, we said, Oh my God, this is just so dark and, 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 debilitating to read it's depressing in some ways <laughs> and it's not capturing half the story and right. Daniel really really adamant about that he just because he's more of a pessimist where I'm, I'm kind of an optimist and so he or sorry the other way around he's the <laughs> optimist I'm the pessimist and uh, he he just said you know what we got to put in the way these kids show agency and empowerment every day despite all these overwhelming odds aligned against them so, and he, he tells the story about walking the bull all the time to these, these kids and, and they know about that story through him. So he, he was really insistent and, and, and convinced me pretty easily to, to include this because it really needed that. And it is really a balance between yes. these overwhelming forces of, 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 of abuse and social injustice, but on the ground, these kids, how they deal with that by helping one another with these small acts of kindness. Wow. So, uh, go ahead. Yeah, so to add on to what Chris is saying, it's an African proverb to, to be kind to the next person. Like Chief Kasere, when he was given food by the old lady, he, he was exhausted, he collapsed, and he got something to keep him strong. And he asked, how could I ever repay you? And the lady said, you must walk the bowl to the next person, like Chris said. So it's an act of kindness, giving it back to the next person. Awesome. Yes. Yeah, that, that was such a touching story, how each one of the, the kids found it in their own way yes. to try to, you know, to you know, pass it forward or walk the bowl to the next. 
even when uh, Kapala didn't understand what it meant, she still tried to move forward and do something for the, the her new friend, her new fr yes. newfound friend. Without giving too much away from it, but you understand yeah. she, but which was great, you know. So, what inspired you guys to write the book? I mean, I know you was doing research first. But how did the book really come about? Was that something you had was intentional, or was it just kind of it was an aha moment? Yeah, um, yeah. To to answer on that one, we were both frustrated with how street kids were described in the literature. Uh, they were based on rapid surveys and statistics for a certain professional audience. So yeah, this led us to, that's what inspired us. Actually me personally yeah. in writing the book. Yeah, to follow up on that, I, I would say uh, when you read a lot of it, you don't read too many books about street kids, yes. their everyday lives, daily experiences. Um, if the only things you do find are these uh, academic or professional reports that Daniel's talking about. And we need that stuff. That information is important. But it sometimes reduces the kids to a bunch of numbers and statistics and, and kind of objectifies them. And we really wanted to uh, make it, you know, write a story that talked about the kids, uh, their own perspectives, their own experiences and their own stories, because they, they really do have their own stories. And, and we didn't want to make them subjects as much as agents, you know, in, in, in yeah. this book. So that was important to both of us. Yeah. You, you all did a great job because, yes, we have a lot of numbers, analytics, but you put a face to each each individual, even though even the supporting children, a part of the story still had a face. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, there's a lot of second kind of, I guess you would call secondary characters in there other than the four main children. Um, and everyone has just this unique personality. Uh, it's, it's, it's hard to even, you know, describe how, how, how amazing and intelligent and, and aware these kids are of their situation and, and how they, they adopt very different survival strategies to, to live on the street. Um, but every single one of those kids just was their own unique individual. And uh, there were so many others that we could have included in the book. That was the hardest thing to do is to, you know, who do we right. focus on? Because <laughs> they're all amazing kids. Yeah, it's, it's, it's so much to, I mean, in my mind, I just hearing the story, it's almost like, it could be a sequel to this just because there's so much you could tell. I mean, because in the form of research, you could do. You, do you still keep in contact with some of the children? Yeah, for sure. Um, Daniel's still working with them. Yes. Um, so he sees okay. them a lot. And uh, but there's just so many. There's so many that come and go so quickly on the streets that um, it's we don't keep in contact with with. Uh, these four as much, much. now. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Because right. Their, their life situation has changed. Yeah. A lot of kids just, you, you, they disappear one day, you know, and you don't know what's going on. Wow. So it's really hard. And Lusaka has, you know, the num the how many kids are actually living on the street yes. varies, but it's, it's in the thousands. Yes. Is, is Lusaka doing anything about it or is it, are they, have they just turned a blind eye to the situation? Because you kind of talk about it, how, they really, the government say they're doing something about it, but they really are not, unless they're doing a, a massive sweep every once in a while, you know, the children. Yeah, sweeps are a big thing in a lot of countries here uh, where the police come in just because public opinion yes. kind of, you know, it kind of turns against the kids or they think the, the problem is getting out of control or something like that. So the police feel like they have to take action. And what they do, like, you know, because they're not social workers, they 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 sweep in literally and 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 put these kids in in trucks, load them off, and take them somewhere, often to jail or prison, or um, sometimes they've been known to dump them in in the middle of, of towns three hundred miles away. Yeah, uh, that just happens a lot. It happens in a lot of countries: Zambia, Namibia, uh, everywhere. Yeah, to wow. to add on. To add on to what Chris says is, yeah, they do take them away, put them in trucks. Sometimes they have camps, refugee camps, 
outside and then they they keep them there like uh in a in a big uh, area so yeah that's that's wow. precisely what Chris is saying yeah they call them vocational or training centers, centers. <laughs> but they're not really. they're not uh, no that, yeah. that's yeah. not even remotely close to because I think you even uh talk about one uh, one incident where they it was where one of them were allegedly supposed to be going to this rehabilitation Patient. center and it was far from that. Yeah. yeah. Daniel was, was shipped to one when he was uh yeah when he was younger. Oh wow. That's right. Because you're talking about yourself, exactly. Yeah, Man, that yeah. Was... That's very, very tough because um um it gets emotional as well. But yeah, um it's it's very tough to live out on the streets, living from uh the trash can sometimes pieces of food that uh, is being picked up so yeah it's 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 tough but they really don't rehabilitate you as as a person you 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 need to do it yourself yeah yeah daniel you seem to be a person of, of peace right now how did you find your peace how did you how was you able to free your mind from what you lived and had to deal with to be if anyone have met you without you saying it, they would not expect or even assume that. Yeah. You're not carrying that burden on your shoulders. Yeah. No, it's, 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 it's really difficult to do that. So yeah. Um, it's not easy. It's, it's really, but Chris can, can add on to. Well, he's being humble. I yeah. think he's yeah. just say he's, he's, uh, I know what helps Daniel. It's that he's, he's become a social worker himself. And in turn, you know, uh, Kind of turns around and helps the kids every day he's on the streets um using his own knowledge of the streets and to, to, to help them because it's hard to build trust but yes. this guy this guy builds trust with yeah. the kids because he's been there he's seen it he's just not he's being humble right now yeah. so. so so like i said uh, in the beginning it's uh it's very important to build the trust because once they don't trust you they will not open up to you yeah yeah, yeah. So being that. there myself is is is, is I've, I've 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 built trust with the kids, and that's why they love me, and that's I love awesome. them. Awesome. Yeah. So how did you two guys meet? Yeah, um, we met uh, in Lusaka in in Zambia at a conference in, in Lusaka. But Chris can uh, emphasize more on that. Yeah, we met in. Uh, it was I can't remember the year now, but it's been like. I don't know, eight or nine years ago that we first met and it was a conference on something like youth empowerment or something like that. Uh, it was a small conference and I wasn't even supposed to go, but uh, I ended up going at the last second and then we met. Daniel had read some articles I wrote on street kids uh, in Tanzania when I worked there. And I have to admit some of those articles were the exact kind of things I, we critique in the book, which is like, you know, kind of objectifying these kids using numbers a lot. And that's just, that's, that's, that that was part of those academic studies that I was involved with, but at the same time, really frustrated with. And as we learned that that you know we had this similar interest in depicting the kids as kids with stories with amazing lives, um, we we thought, well, we don't know of any kind of book that that does this uh, for a wider audience. Yeah. So how do we do this? How do we combine the methods we have, which is like this total immersion on the streets, but at the same time write a, a really compelling um, story about a few kids that, that, like you said in the beginning, reads like a novel. Yeah. But you know, sometimes, sometimes truth is is stranger than fiction, and, and that's exactly what we yeah. found. Yeah. Uh, it's that's that's kind of how it came about. It's it's there's a lot of frustration. Um, amongst any kind of outreach worker or, 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 or researchers like myself who work with street kids because it's just, it's, it's hard to capture that world, it really is. And, and there's no precedent for how to do it in, in previous work. So we really want to do something different. Right. So Tiger, to add what Chris just said, it's, it's, it's a rare breed. It's rare to have a book written about street kids. So it's very rare. You don't really find it uh, right. among bookshops. Yeah. Yeah. I hope that that this book will take off because it really becomes a good life lesson 
uh, for people, just common people who have the misconception of what street children are. You know, as you know, Chris, in America, that would be equivalent to being homeless. Yeah. But we don't even here in America, we turn our head a lot of times to homeless people, not knowing the situation would put them there. And now there was one case you had an eight year old boy, like they put him on a bus, sent him to Lusaka with the intent to find someone that he'd never seen in his entire life. Right. Yeah. That's, uh, that's crazy. Yeah. And, and they, you, you know, some of these extended family members really don't have the kid's best interests in mind. Uh, so if a mother or father dies, uh, for, for whatever reason, um, the kid is passed along maybe to an uncle who, who, who might abuse them. Okay. They move to an aunt or this or that. And they go down the line until they just feel like there's, there's no option here. And that whole extended family network, which is really strong in Africa for the most part. Um, right. I mean, it's amazing. But it does fail from time to time for whatever reason. And that's where you get these kids on the streets. Yeah. So... And once they end up there, it's it's kind of a, like the general public. They, it's it's the same as in the states. You know, people kind of turn their heads and look away or look for the easy answer. You know, it's easy to call them criminals or thieves or this or that. But but this it's it's the furthest thing from the truth. They're just they're kids trying to survive um, with very little options left. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, which is so heartbreaking. It's heart wrenching. Just to, you know, just thinking about the stories and even uh, the young boy who was murdered. Just to, you know, you, you touched on his life a little bit in the book, and that was heart wrenching as well. I mean, everything you can see the connection between each person and their ain'ts. Their, you know, either they had love in their heart or it was about greed and power or whatever that cause the breakdown of, of the relationships. So yeah. what do you want readers to, to take away from the book? What are two or three things you think that they really need to just hone in on when they read this book? For me personally, the part that I like is walking the boat. That's, it's a highlight. It's, 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 it's it stands out. So for me, it's walking the boat, giving it to the next person, the, yeah. the, the act of kindness. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with Daniel there. It's that. And, and knowing that those little acts of kindness, paying it forward, make a huge difference, even uh, in, in the face of such overwhelming odds. Like you can't think of uh, the situation um, more more horrible than being a street kid um, anywhere in the world. So, so yeah. Yeah. to have that happen and then to, 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 to rely on these small favors and this really tight network they have amongst one another, um, that it's just so inspiring. And that's, I think we want, we want readers to take away the, the idea that the little things do make a difference. Yes. So Absolutely. whatever they can do. But also just to be aware of this this issue, this growing but I don't want to call it a problem. It's just a growing growing issue in terms of the number of street children in the world. Um, I don't want to I, I say I don't want to call it a problem because I don't want to label them as a problem or criminals or anything oh, like that. Understood. understood. I agree yeah, with you. I agree with you. Yeah. 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 So it, it's more like you know these are kids who have great opportunity and just because they are a great. Uh, possibilities still in their life so just because they live on the street um doesn't doesn't uh change that no it it the, probably the best answer is to have at least 10 more uh daniels running around that's what you really need that that'll help slowly help the problem yeah not the children but it's the problem but the overall problem of what you know of them in their situation you know yeah. but you know, I commend you, Daniel. You're doing an awesome job, but you know, but but you're one man. Yes. How deep is your faith? Yeah, I I'm a very uh, I'm a Christian, 
Yeah, uh, I'm, I believe in, 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 in God and he's the one that helped us. He's the one that's because of him, that's why we are here. So yeah, my faith is very, very strong. Uh, I can actually, uh, I want to uh, take something out from the Bible that says your faith has to be like a master seed. And that's a, 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 a verse that, 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 that really touched me and give me courage to do what I'm doing for the kids and, and for everyone else. That's good. That's good. What was the hardest part for either one of you for, for, for right when you were writing this book? What was the hardest part of it? Uh, I think, uh, well, I don't, I think for both of us or anyone working with street kids, it's just to see the daily abuses and violence that, that takes place. Um, it's not even daily. It's, it's every minute. It seems like there's just something horrible. You turn around and you just go, Oh my God, I can't believe that just happened. And that can be really stressful for, for anyone. I, I, for me, I only get parts of it. Daniel has been immersed in it. So he sees so much more. Um, at the same time, um, it was really, it's difficult to do that. And then at the same time, we had to set up like really rigid, uh, ethical guidelines for working with these kids because uh, they're so vulnerable. Um, so we set up our own ethics advisory committee made up of community leaders, um, uh, teachers, preachers, uh, elders. Uh, so we had like 10 or 12 different folks there and we met with them constantly to, to because when things come up, we, we needed their guidance because we didn't just want to go in like mercenary researchers and, 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 and unintentionally mess things up in any way. So, and since these kids don't have guardians or a lot of them have guardians who aren't looking uh, out for them, basically, uh, you know, we had to have this sort of body on the side that th this ethics committee that, that, um, we constantly turn to for, for help. So um, that was that was very powerful to have that um, to have those folks um, really guide our work uh, because it, it can be so so difficult and so so challenging. Yeah, I can imagine. Daniel, anything you want, anything you want to add to that? Yeah, that's uh, basically it's. Uh, the kids are vulnerable and uh, it's, it's very, very difficult. And also touch based on the trust, you need to win the trust so that you can get something out from them. Yeah. Did you all, what did you learn? Did you all learn anything about yourselves after writing this book? Uh, for me, I, I think I learned a lot. Like I said earlier, uh, I learned so much uh, from Daniel in terms of not always looking at the the worst side of things. That these these kids do have agency, they do have power, and um, if you place them in good programs, like long term programs, and you really help them over the long long term, like school programs and other things, and and repatriate repatriating them uh, with different family members who, who will look out for them, um, you'll find that uh, these kids' lives can really turn around very quickly. So um, for me, that, 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 that was really important. Okay, Daniel, I'm scared. Yeah, yeah, Daniel, anything uh, for yourself? Did you learn anything? Yeah, um, obviously, Kindness, humbleness, for me, stood out. To be kind, to be hum humble, and to be helpful. That's the three that stood out for me. Okay. What motivates you guys every day? What, what motivates you to get up to, to, just to keep moving? Because it can be depressing just going through every day, seeing talking to young kids, babies, literally babies, 
and you see them and continue doing what they're doing, even though you know that you're trying to help them in some sort of way off the street to empower them. So what motivates you to keep moving every day? Uh, for me, it's, uh, you know, the street kids themselves or, uh, uh, or the, the kids themselves are really motivating. Um, hey, hey Chris, they, yeah. Chris, can you hold, hold for one second? I'm, I got a guy coming to the house and he, he, I knew he was going to come and repair it. As soon as I was up. <laughs> no I'm going to, I'm going to pause this right quick yeah. and I'm going to let him come in and he can get started and I'll be right back. Yeah, yeah, sure. No worries. Sorry about that. No worries. All right. Uh, I got to remember. Oh, what mo the question was, was motivation. And you were just getting ready to answer that, Chris? Yeah, I was just going to say, um, you know, obviously the kids motivate me. Uh, and working with those, those kids is, is a pretty amazing experience. But I think I'll let Daniel talk about that a bit more. For me, it's another thing that, you know, a big motivation for writing this book was was just uh, you know, exposing uh, exposing this issue to a wider public because um, in all the things that are going on in this day and age, sometimes we forget that you know things like street kids that the populations are just growing exponentially around the world, um, not just Africa. It's everywhere. The United States doesn't matter. It's it's, it's just part of this widening gap between the haves and the have nots. And this is just the most, you know, the most obvious manifestation of that. Um, and it's children, they're children. So it's, it's, it's just keeping this in the forefront of, of our minds and the conversation. That's, that's, that motivates me. And for Daniel. Yeah, for me, it's basically the children, the kids. They motivate me and uh, resilience, their intelligence, emotions. That's, that's what, what they motivates me. Yeah. Okay. All right. Gentlemen, I appreciate you very much for your time. Ladies and gentlemen, we have been talking with Chris and Daniel about the new book, Walking the Bowl, which is a very, is a very heartfelt book. It's a true story. Like I said, it reads like a novel. So this is something worth to, to read to your family. Before we go, is there anything you guys like to add? If you know, if you have any social media handles, anything you'd like to share? Uh, social media, I knew you were gonna ask that question. We're really <laughs> bad at that. Yeah. Um, Not a problem. Not a problem. <laughs> we're both really bad at that. We know that's gonna anger our publisher and everything else. So. Um, we're working on that. And otherwise, I would just say, you know, you can you can find this book uh, at, at most places, your own store that you mentioned and Amazon. And look at some of the early reviews on good Goodreads and, yes. and, and other things. So the book is easy to find out there um, on most most websites. Just Google it up and you'll you'll find it. Um, but social media. Yeah, we're still working on that one. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. You keep Stay in the trenches. Keep working. Keep the faith. Keep working on Daniel. Keep working on Chris. Help him with his pessimism. So he can <laughs> keep walking the ball. Thank yeah. you. Stay yeah, encouraged. Me, to stay strong. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, for me, in conclusion, is just um, we hope the Black community in the States read this book because one purpose of the book is to strengthen the connection uh, between Black American and countries like Zambia. And then the second thing is we want to create awareness about social injustices that are important to both communities because the fight for justice and human rights is a global fight. Yes. Thanks very much. You guys make it a great day. Continue being creative, continue motivating, and stay strong. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Walk in the bowl.